So welcome and thank you for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Beatrice Dupuis and I'm Director of Circle. I'm joined today by Kate Mackay, Associate Director and Marisol Aguirre, uh, Outreach Coordinator, and both of them will be monitoring this webinar behind the scenes. So it's time to get started with a few announcements first. For those who are not, for those of you who are not already familiar with Circle, we are one of 16 language resource centers funded under Title VI by the US Department of Education. And our mission is to develop and provide quality instructional uh, materials and professional learning opportunities like the one today to language educators. Circle is housed in the College of Humanities here at the University of Arizona. So for more information, you can uh, visit the links at the bottom of this slide. So today's webinar is the last of a three-part series focused on digital multimodal composition in language education that started back in May. So please note that the recordings of the past two webinars are now available on our YouTube channel. We are preparing uh, a new webinar series on virtual exchange. We have three speakers lined up, Dr. Robert O'Dowd from Universidad de Leon in Spain, Caroline Fuchs from Northwestern University and Marta Tessador from Arizona State University. So please save the dates. ASLA, our local language association, is organizing a two-day workshop uh, that will be led by Paul Sandrock, the former ACTFL Director of Education. If interested, please scan the QR code to register, and there is a $40 fee to attend. Now, the four Title VI centers at the University of Arizona are working together to offer a free two-day workshop on the topic of less commonly taught languages at Hispanic serving institutions. The lineup of speakers should be finalized soon, so stay tuned for more information coming from Circle. So it is now time for me to introduce our presenter. Dr. Marie-José Amel has been actively involved in computer assisted language learning, otherwise known as CAL, teaching, research, and development since 1994. She worked at the Center for Computational Linguistics at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology in Great Britain for 10 years as co-investigator of an EU-funded NLP-based called project uh, called Free Text. She then took a position as Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics in the Department of French at Dalhousie University in Canada, and she joined the Official Languages and Bilingual Institute Bilingualism Institute at the University of Ottawa in 2009. Dr. Amel has an interest in language technologies, uh, call ergonomics, blended learning, and um, in the context of language teaching and learning, the development of digital literacy uh, for the teaching and learning of languages. And she currently collaborates as a Canadian expert on a project from the European Center for Modern Languages called ELANG, uh, and our webinar today uh, is entitled Real World Tasks to Develop Digital Citizenship and Literacy in Language Learning. Marie-José, the floor is yours. It's a big floor. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. I'm going to now share my screen. So thank you very much, Beatrice, for your kind introduction and to you and your team at The Circle, Kate, Marisol, for this really unique opportunity to share my work with such a large and varied audience of language practitioners. Uh, it's a real privilege. I have noted down the countries where you come from so far. I have Oman, Romania, UK, Portugal. I have the USA, Austria, India, and so on and so forth. So it is really extraordinary to be able to gather uh, so many people at, at the same time virtually. Thank you very much. So in order to break the ice a little bit, I know that you have done it in the, in the chat. Uh, uh, before we start, I really like to do this activity with my students and I will ask you to, um, to select the link that uh, Marisol will share with you in the, um, in the chat and to geolocalize yourself on a digital world, world map using Padlet. So this is an activity that I use with my students to you know, develop like a social cohesion. Um, I've never done it with 500 people, uh, but I am hoping that uh, we won't crash the site. So first, if you've done this before, go ahead with it. 
Uh, so first, what you do is you search the place where you live or where you currently are or you teach. And I can see pins already been dropped. Uh, you can send us a little word and say uh, a little brief paragraph or sentence about yourself. Hello. I am Marie-Josée. I teach at the University of Ottawa in Canada. And if you want, you can even add a picture that actually Padlet geolocalizes for you. And here you can see my actual, my actual building. Let's publish this. So here I am and I have several people who've already pinned themselves. Thank you. Let's see if we can reach the number of people we have in the webinar. Hello from Indonesia. Hello, Dania. Daniela from Sibiu, Romania. I'll let you continue with this while I talk. So for me, it's been, as Beatrice said, uh, uh, now that we know a little bit more about each other, uh, I'm gonna talk about myself briefly, 30 years of language teaching with and about technology. Um, 30 years of involvement with technology mediated language teaching and, and learning. And as you know, applied linguistics really means that teaching and research are closely linked together, that pedagogical data produced by our teaching directly feeds our research, and that theorization that emerge from these data goes back into our pedagogical intervention. So currently, and for the past seven or eight years, these are the three courses that I designed and I currently teach that really nourish my, nourish my research and my teaching. Um, one is called, it's a, a French second language teaching uh, course. Uh, it's called Technology, Internet, and Social Media for French as a second language. The second one is uh, a course that I teach to trainee teachers. It's called Educational Technology and Second Language Teaching. And the last one is a master's uh, level course in our master's in bilingualism studies at Olby. Uh, and it's called the Trends and Issues in Research on Technology Mediated Language Learning. And um, this, uh, this has brought me uh, as a Canadian uh, expert delegated from Olby, um, to work with the ECML, the European Center for Modern Languages, as a Canadian partner, together with uh, my co good colleague, uh, Catherine Coz from the University of Victoria. Um, so, um, so what I will present and share with you today is a little bit of my practice, and it's the approach and a concept that we have worked together with the team on two projects, one called Elang and the other one called Elang Citizen. So my uh, webinar will look like this. First, I'm going to go through um, the aim of those two projects from the ECML. Then I will move on to core concepts such as digital citizenship and digital literacy. Uh, and then I will uh, detail our pedagogical approach um, the concept, this, uh, the concept of real-world tasks, amongst other concepts, and also uh, the posture, the the learner and teacher's roles uh, within this pedagogy, and example uh, examples of my own practice and uh, examples uh, developed through the Elang Citizen uh, project will be. Uh, I will be looked at. So my uh, my besties, uh, my best digital tasks, and also a template to create a similar task and those that have already be, been uh, created through the project. So Elang uh, Citizen Projects, two projects. Uh, so my collaboration with the ECML has really started in 2016, where I first was invited to, uh, to join the Elang team. Um, I'm going to open the, the website and you can do it also after. 
Um, I'm not going to do a thorough display of all the resources developed through this project, but what I'm going to say that first, there's a, a wonderful team uh, that was led by Christian Olivier from the University um, from the University of La Réunion. Um, and uh, throughout this project, the aim of uh, Elang was really to develop a pedagogical approach for the use of digital tools and resources in language teaching and learning with an emphasis on the importance of uh, social interactions in, in human communication and action. And this social interactional approach uh, was implemented through uh, the concept of through real world tasks, which I will explain later, uh, typically perform online on uh, participatory sites. So what you want to uh, retain or what you want to, to, to look at uh, on this website is, is uh, several things. One of them uh, being uh, our framework that we developed. And the other one is a Moodle platform where you can access um, examples as well, which I'm not going to talk about today, but also it covers, um, it, cover, it, it kind of um, shows online tasks that cover specifically some language competences, so, such as oral receptions or production, written productions and so on. So you are welcome to, uh, to go on the Moodle site and uh, to, to look at those resources that we have developed through this, uh, this prior, I will call it prior pandemic uh, kind of project. And the other, the other project, a more um, recent one that has just terminated actually, it was a little delayed during, um, during the COVID is called uh, Di um, Digital Citizenship Through Language Education. Um, and um, the website is presently being constructed. So the English, uh, the English is a translation, a machine translation of the French website, except for the digital task that we will see the database later on, and also the the, the, the didactical or the pedagogical approach, um, which are uh, two uh, documents that you you have access to and that. Um, that have been written in English. And the aim, it's a follow-up to the first project. So the aim um, of uh, Elang Citizen it really is to help language learners become digital citizens and develop uh, this capacity to use digital media critically, creatively, and autom autonomously in several languages. Um, and it builds on national policies and recommendations from the Council of Europe to develop um, a pedagogical framework and some resources to be used by language teachers like you. Um, and we will explore this in more details uh, throughout the project, uh, throughout this uh, webinar. So now we're moving on to core concepts. First, uh, alongside the, this statement uh, by the Council of Europe, as an educator, I do believe that education is and serves the development of democratic citizenship uh, by, uh, by equipping learners with knowledge, with skills and understanding and molding their attitudes and behaviors to empower them to exercise and defend their democratic rights and responsibilities in society, to value diversity and to play an active part in democratic life with a view to the promotion and protection of democracy and the rule of law. And this is a statement, a strong statement by the Council of Europe. Um, I'm not going to go to this website. You can, you can have access to it after and see what the Council of Europe has, uh, has to say about uh, democracy and, and, uh, and then uh, citizenship. Um, and as language uh, education plays an important part in in digital, sorry, in democratic uh, culture and education, it is also our role to develop learners with the ability to communicate, which themselves require awareness, attitudes, knowledge, and skills promoted by the Council of Europe, namely. Also develop plurilingual competence 
uh, such as intercomprehension skills, intercultural awareness, etc. Mediation competence, very important to be able to manage interactions uh, or facilitate a discussion, to understand the other, to understand not only the language, but the cultures uh, and how are things are said and done uh, with a reference to the uh, common European framework of reference for, uh, for languages. And finally, this capacity to adapt to diversity uh, of human beings, of societies, and of communities. So now that we have talked about citizenship as a wide concept, What's your take about digital citizenship? Can you think of one word that comes to your mind to define this digital citizenship? So let's try to build a word cloud together. So what I am going to ask you is to input only one word uh, in, our, in, in, uh, in this app and we will see uh, if, we, um, if together we can uh, see what concepts comes to, comes to mind and, and if there are some com common concepts uh, that that you know we can together arrive at so this this is a biased <laughs> survey because you can see what other people are actually inputting um but i can see responsibility again with <laughs> uh, capital and non capitalized it's not a very clever uh, piece of a uh, of software, you should gather this together, but online presence, responsibility again, globalization, respect, representation, transformative, belonging, digital literacy, long, <laughs> long statements as well, knowledge and respect of various forms of digital cultures, and media, very dynamic. Thank you very much. So there is a, pl a plethora of definitions for digital citizenship. Um, and the one that I have selected is Canadian, of course. Uh, it comes from uh, mediasmarts.ca, which is Canada's center uh, for digital media literacy. It is a simple, but to the point, Definition. Digital citizenship is the ability to navigate our digital environments, in plural, in a way that's safe and responsible and to actively and respectfully engage in these spaces. Um, it's easy to use and to understand and, and the students, when I present and I talk about developing this digital citizenship, do, do kind of um, understand this well. Um, the website, which I'm going to show you now, the website uh, is rich. It's a really uh, rich in resources for educator as well as for parents. Uh, and it has a strong focus, as you can see here, uh, on uh, digital media literacy. And it uh, namely suggests a model of access, use, understand, and engage with media that's quite powerful. So I invite you later on to explore and use uh, this, uh, this very rich resource. So you cannot be a digital a citizen, a digital citizen on your own. That's one thing to understand. So citizenship happens in society, happens with people, Therefore, social interactions are really essential in order to activate one's citizenship. Indeed, social interactions are, they form the central and decisive element of all actions and communication for individuals, particularly for citizens, users of languages and digital tools. Social interactions, they play a critical influence on the various options that are required for action and interactions and regarding the construction of meaning. And social interactions are dynamic and also evolve as actions occur. So for that reason, we consider that, that the language learner is 
a user of languages and technologies as a social agent, a social actor with plural identities involved in various communities, online and offline. Sometimes the line is blurred between both because one continues online and comes back in <laughs> offline and so on, uh, whose actions are largely influenced by rights and responsibilities and are linked to individual and shared values um, with a, a sense of ethics. Uh, also interacting and acting with technologies in various digital spaces in specific areas, in specific ways, based on personal attributes, such as being competent, informed, secure, responsible, ethical, and critical, and also depending on the context. So this is the portrait that we have built um, in, in, um, in the course of the project Elang, whereby we see this language learner really as a social agent. And you can see that in these communities, A, B, and C, the social action uh, are different, may be different. Sometimes a posture may be as an observer or someone who shares knowledge, you know, information or knowledge. In another community, for instance, uh, social actions could be transformative, uh, could be the production or, or the co-production of knowledge and uh, and the same with another in other communities. So really, a digital citizenship is not a, a unique passport. We can say that uh, digital citizenship allows an individual to have uh, several passports. You know that they will um, that they will wave in different communities, and and these communities also have interactions between them. The concept of digital literacy really converges with that of digital citizenship. And in order to be a digital citizen, one has to have, one has to develop digital literacy. Indeed, the digital literacy competences are essential to participate fully in today's societies as citizens and digital citizens. Digital literacy concerns the individual, their competences, Whereas digital citizenship is a societal issue that goes beyond the individual and is focused on relationships with others. So digital citizenship, to put it strongly, can be seen as a social extension of digital literacy. And the definition I have for you, and again, there's a plethora of definitions of digital literacy, the one by Martin and uh, Grudziecki, is the one that uh, influenced us in the work we did with the Elang project. So digital literacy is the awareness, attitude, and ability of individuals to appropriately use digital tools and facilities to identify, access, manage, integrate, evaluate, analyze, and synthesize digital resources, construct new knowledge, create media expressions, communicate with others, in the context of specific life situations in order to enable constructive social action and to reflect upon this process. I think it's very comprehensive. I really, really like this, um, this definition. And so from that definition, we kind of have devised uh, a model and we've, see digital we approach digital literacy as a multifaceted fluid concept which is as i said before very much about personal development so the model we devised it gathers three main dimensions a first dimension a very bottom and important one is techn technology literacy it's the know-how literacy how to make use of technological affordances that tools, apps, websites, media bring us. These affordances can be 
um, typically discovered in action while using it. You discover then that, you know, a website could be useful for your learners, could be useful for um, getting in touch with people who speak the language you're learning and so on and so forth. Second group of literacy is meaning-making literacy uh, comprised of media literacy. So media literacy create various forms of messages on various media. Uh, knowledge of how information is generated and disseminated. This is uh, more the, the background literacy, we call it, you know, knowing how things were built or things are made or how it got there. Um, information literacy, um, finding, understanding, classifying, evaluating information. Multimodal literacy, uh, core to me and important. Uh, how to convey meaning through a combination of various modes, written, oral, audiovisual, images, and so on, visual. And the third important group of literacy is in interaction literacy. Interaction literacy comprising technology-mediated communication literacy, collaborative or collaboration literacy, and participation literacy. These three really uh, concern the interpersonal skills needed to make and share meaning to contribute as digital citizens. Now I have a small question for you. Uh, what about AI literacy? Our, our, my, my talk, my webinar today will not, you've, you've heard and you've done uh, things around AI uh, so far. I'm going to present and talk about other types of activities that are also valuable, not only uh, focused on AI, but still, you know, in that model that uh, that we proposed in 2018, there was no question of AI. And today we talk a lot about AI literacy. And I'd be interested to know um, your take on AI literacy. Where does it fit in this model, according to you? Does it? Uh, under which broader category, uh, technology, meaning making, interaction literacy, uh, would you place it? So you could answer in the chat. So I see tech literacy, tech, interaction, yes. Meaning making and tech, mix for me, all of these, <laughs> zone less. <laughs> You can continue. I will. I will uh, move on. But what I want to say is, you, you're right. When you think about it, there are skills that are involving technology. Others, obviously, you uh, meaning making literacy, uh, and also you have to interact with generative AI. You know, if to, together you want to collaborate or you know and communicate, so that uh, that meaning can be also co-created. So. Um, um, with that, our framework comes, you know, in specific social interactional context and also in spatiotemporal material context um, and wrapped up in civic, ethical and critical framework. And when we talk about AI, obviously that's, uh, that's very closely involved. Before we move on to the pedagogical approach, I would like to know um, about your digital practices. So what role does the development of digital literacy play in your language teaching? So for now, B seems to be, <laughs> it is an important component, but not the central focus of my teaching. A primary focus for some, addressed occasionally, depending on the lesson or topic. Not currently very little, but some people do not have it currently included in their teaching approach, but it could be. So it seems that for those who have answered the uh, majority of you, not the majority of you listening, but the, the majority of you who have answered, it is an important component and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but not the central focus of your teaching, uh, because I know that you're also focusing on specific language components and also cultural components and in class and also uh, other means than digital means. And that's uh, that's really fair enough. Do I have any questions or comments so far before we move on to uh, pedagogy? 
Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, so we have one question from Martine uh, asking, could you share your thoughts on how Martin and Al's 2006 definition of digital literacy might be updated to incorporate the emergence and integration of artificial intelligence? It's a big question. <laughs> um, if I go back uh, to this definition, um, I don't know if I would modify it because I would consider that the, you know within the use of digital tools we we incorporate the use of a, a you know inter uh, in generative intelligence artificial so being able to collaborate with the tool and I think that um, and that collaboration with other tools also you know may be involved I don't know if I would change it much um, I think that I would consider and continue considering uh, AI and, and generative AI as a tool um, that will help me either and that, you know, that will help me in my seek for information, for creation of meaning and et cetera. So I'm not sure I answered your question the way you want to, me to answer, but uh, perhaps you have your say on that, Martine. Thank you. So we have another question by Aslam. In what sense collaborative literacy is dis distinct from participation literacy? How do yes. you relate this to the notion of social agency? Yes, uh, it's a good question. I think that we wanted to distinguish both because in collaboration, um, it is th th those skills are the skills you know where you need to know what's your role vis-a-vis -vis the other person, uh, how together you will come up, you co-create uh, meaning and participation. Maybe has more to do with when you encounter uh, you know spaces online um, on you know say for instance a discussion forum. What are the norms and conventions? How should I, you know, how should I be? How should I, you know, uh, as a citizen interact and participate? What are the rules um, which are implicit or explicit that I must uh, know uh, in order to be a fit, you know, in that particular community? Great, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question and then we'll move on and we we'll, can come back to uh, the remainder. Somebody is saying, how, how can we preserve our citizenship? So I think it's, and culture in the digital, di digital age. We can only enrich it, I would say. Um, our, our digital citizenships and cultures are cultivated mm -hmm. and their dynamics, you know, as you know, we may belong to a community, participate and be active and then move, move on. Huh? People have moved from Facebook to Instagram, for instance, people have stopped participating on Twitter. So I think we, we, be, we, we, we have our, our identity as a person, our values and beliefs and, um, and that we continue having them when we do participate in different communities with different citizenship passports, but we have our own and unique, you know, stamp. And that's how I, I, I see it. And sometimes the values shared by a community, um, we don't, you know, we, we don't like them or we don't wish, you know, to, to be involved in them and we, we quit or some sites or some communities, uh, evolve and their evolution agrees or don't agree with us so that's that's how i i would uh, i would answer this question mm -hmm. great thank you so maybe we can continue and then we'll take a few more questions later down the the presentation thank you so we are for an active participatory transformative and reflective pedagogy where learners really perform digital tasks in authentic social interactions outside the educational environment. We want our learners to engage the world as Dubray and Thorne, 2017, uh, have written about. 
We want learners to have opportunities to act and interact for real and to contribute to participatory websites as full users of those sites and not in the posture of language learners. And we also want them to reflect on their actions and participation and interpersonal interactions in real life context. So our pedagogical approach is task-based essentially. Uh, so let's first recall what, what these tasks are. So from Bygate and uh, and colleague um, will take this definition. A task is a focused, well-defined activity related to learner, learner choice or learning processes, I would say, and learning processes that requires learners to use language, focusing on meaning primarily rather than form to achieve a goal. Um, Marta gonzalez Yore who has written a lot about TBLT and Lord Ortega have identified five critical elements to uh, task-based language teaching. A tasks or tasks must have meanings. They must have clear goals. They are student-centered. They are contextualized and they engage reflection. And I think that's a very important part. So the Elang team really pushes further the concept of task by introducing the one of real world tasks. And these are tasks that, are, that, contain, that contain a pedagogical element, a language dimension that is performed in the real world, i.e. outside the educational institution online. And they engage language learners in social interactions guided by explicit and implicit social norms. Uh, real-world tasks have actually pre-existing a pre-existing nature. They they exist with their community, and our learners go and engage in those communities. So there are not tasks created for them uh, to develop a community, but really we send them out, and they go as users of those communities and explore. Uh, so prior to their pedagogical application, they already exist and communities are out there. So the model is as such, first of all, um, within this social interaction, interactional framework, uh, um, learners as users of languages, they have intention of communication with other users. Um, and they will execute the task in stages to a range of activities. And these activities are not all necessarily language-based. We can think about gaming, for instance, uh, and, but they prioritize meaning. And the learners actually go through the process of participating, um, resorting to their own internal resources and also with the help of external resources, human teacher help and or technological help as well uh, to, um, to arrive at an output to produce. Uh, producing could mean uh, that, the, that the, the learners um, are in the postures of consumers. They read a recipe, they go on a website, they, they, they for instance, like something so that's a minimal kind of participation in, the, in, types of, in, in terms of output, but they can also post a recipe on this website. And, and, and that, that puts them in an expert position where they create a recipe and they bring it to the community. So real world tasks are found on open and participatory sites where learners make meaningful use of the target language in situations which enable them to interact authentically and meet real community communicative needs. Uh, through participation in these sites, they build an identity in the target language and an identity as users and not just learners. And in some cases, they become experts as I just illustrated now and I'll show you other examples after. They are motivated to learn that languages are, uh, of their native peers uh, with whom they communicate. 
and they develop strong linguistic and language competences that are specifically adapted to the situations that they encounter. And I think that uh, it, it's interesting to for learners to engage in communities of interest for them. I named cooking, it could be traveling, it could be through sports, it could be through what they're studying, uh, et cetera. So here is an example. We are here on Wiki Travel or Wiki Voyage in French. Um, an example of a real world task where learners had to improve an article uh, in the Wiki Travel Guide in French, uh, developed la the, the year before by some of their peers. And it's an example of a collaborative multimodal writing tasks that puts uh, that really puts the language learners in the position of experts about a place. Here we're talking about Cumberland. It's a little town just nearby Ottawa. Uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, Franco-Ontarians. So there are communities in uh, in Ontario, in Canada, where uh, there are speakers of French. Quebec is the main province um, where people in majority speak French, but in Ontario and some other provinces of Canada, there are minority speakers of French. And the uh, with this course, uh, French as a second language course, I wanted uh, the students to encounter those communities and to showcase them through uh, developing articles on Wikivoyage about uh, those places. So they became, uh, they were in positions of experts and they really became content contributors. Um, and this real world task is a complex one because it requires genre-specific conventional writing uh, that's really watched over by trolls. Uh, some students uh, had experiences of their articles being completely swiped out or others receiving comments that, you know, this was not, um, this was not me meeting the norms that were expected and so on. Uh, so it really develops this uh, participatory culture, such as, uh, you know, put forward by Jenkins and colleagues in 2009. And it is used here as a form of community engagement, showcasing uh, of Franco-Ontarian communities. So I'm going to click on that for real. Um, and what you can see here is, not, you know, the kind of, of writing with hypertext, and you all know Wiki, Wikipedia, and all the products of Wiki, but students had to develop expertise to, you know, um, import those photos and also geolocalization and so on. So um, if you go back here in Ontario, east of Ontario, um, this also explains in French, about the eastern's uh, the eastern part of Ontario, and I'm very proud to say that all the cities here, Belleville, Brockville, Cornwall, Cumberland, Oxbury, and so on, have all been written by my students. And what I do is, one year, some students they do both: they revise and they create, and the year after, they revise and they create. So we end up having uh, some some. Um, articles that are really well uh, well documented and well written. So, so far so good. We have 25 Franco-Ontarian cities or town that have been described since 2017 uh, by my various cohorts of students. So I'm very proud of that. <laughs> so can you think of examples of other types of open and participatory sites which would be good candidates for uh, for having your students meeting communities out there and exercising their digital citizenship while they also have occasions to practice their language. So, so far we have Amazon, Facebook, Kahoot, Padlet, so if, if we stick to the definition of real world task, we have to have an existing community. So I don't know if, you know, and I let you think or tell me in the chat if if Kahoot uh, already has its a community. Are people, you know, doing things together on Kahoot or is the teacher 
building or the students building a kahoot and distribute the kahoot to the class. So does that go beyond the classroom? Padlet, I can understand because Padlet, even though it can be driven by the teachers or by students, it can be open to the world. So the map, for instance, that we together have built uh, earlier on in this talk can be shared and other people could actually join for, from out there. So the same with shared presentations of Google Slide, et cetera, those belong to the classroom. We're talking here about communities ex already existing outside the classroom that we can join. We read it. Reddit is a very good example uh, of a discussion forum uh, on multilingual, well, on in many languages uh, on several topics. Uh, any social media for sure. Nearpod, the art. LinkedIn, an ex another excellent example. YouTube. A very good example as well. Instagram, Twitter, TripAdvisor, excellent. So these are all occasions for learners to do activities, you know, in the digital world. I just want you to think about um, participatory sites that are sites which already have community of users and those users exchange, interact in the language, in the target language, in the language your students are learning. And that will differentiate them from other types uh, like Quizlet or other types of activities that belong, that, has, that, that have a really big foot in the classroom. Yes, Discord, a very good example. And writing reviews for products, hotels, restaurants, excellent, because those uh, like TripAdvisor, for instance, they exist. There's a community out there and there are norms and conventions that, uh, that can be used, super. But yes, real world tasks have a dual grounding. They, in the real life, but also in a teaching and learning context. It's different from the wild, the digital wild, you know, and incidental learning. Um, you as a teacher have already identify the community that would be a good community for your learners to exercise their digital citizenship, citizenship and practice language. So they have a foot in real life. So in those social interactions beyond the educational context with users of communities on the web 2.0, real social interaction challenges, um, as I was explaining before with the example of Wiki Travel, when the, a group of students, uh, they have developed an article on, on and, and then the troll just removed completely the article because it was not following the norms, um, it was incomplete and so on. Other students, you know, may have participated in discussion forums where people could have been rude with them or disagree or and so on. So these can be challenging. Um, social interactional authentic authenticity. In the teaching and learning context, students bring back their experience. They report on, you know, what happened in those communities. So social interactions within the educational context happens between peers if they have worked collaboratively in the class while they share or discuss uh, their usage. And this is a secure space for them. It can also be a practice space for them. Um, and it has social educational challenges as well, which are real and educational authenticity. Um, I think this aligns very well with the pedagogical approach of rewilding uh, recently proposed by Thorne, Ellermont, and uh, Jackanim. And it's an approach that they, te they termed rewilding for its emphasis on designing supportive conditions for goal-directed interaction outside of the classroom. And I think this idea of support uh, and, and to this idea of support, critical reflection, you know, when we think back about um, is part of this uh, dual grounding. So what do learners do when performing real-world tasks? 
well they construct their knowledge their competences and attitudes through diverse real world particip action and that brings them to live communication live sorry communication in authentic situations experience the exercise of citizenship execute their digital literacy and uh, act as reflexive ref and engaged citizens So if that's what learners do, what is your role as a language teacher with real world tasks? Um, if you want to share your thoughts in our Zoom chat, I'd be happy about that. So what is your role as, langu as a language teachers with real world tasks? Coaching students, facilitator, mediator, excellent. I, I think of myself as a facilitator we could have done a cloud with that actually. Eh? So facilitate, facilitator, foster authentic communication, a mediator, supervisor. Oh, <laughs> whoops, it goes fast, but I really like the idea of overcoming institutional restraints. That's true. Providing students with real world task options, support, explain the culture. Yes, culture, norms, convention, Put them in context, design the opportunities. Excellent. Allow and give opportunities, foster respectful environment, totally. Facilitate help, mediator. Staying on top of how tasks evolve and new tasks students are engaging in, totally agree. Develop critical thinking, monitor, assist, Foster transversal competencies, listener, manager. Thank you very much. You are right. Those are good, good answers and those are good roles um, that teachers uh, may want to adopt with real world tasks. So the, the one I have, the ones I have for you are mobilizing the learners to gain their commitment to the task at hand, right? So finding opportunities that are appealing to students. Uh, sometimes they're new or sometimes they're old. When I, uh, one of the tasks I do is, a, is forums and students often they tell me, oh, I, you know, I, I, we don't do forums. I don't do forums. And then I bring them to Le Routa, which is a travel forum. And, and you know, they, they, they kind of discover communities they would not have uh, thought about before. Simplifying the task as well by avoiding uh, cognitive load, overload. So we can approach a community by looking at how people behave. So looking at how they do things, looking at posts and so on. And then we gradually can, you know, move on to uh, actively participate, to produce. Keeping their attention on the essential elements, the social interactions at stake. What's happening? How do I write? Or how do I, you know, I talk? How do, how do we co-create meaning in these different communities? Helping analyze existing productions, very important. Analyze, look at before you do um, as examples of what they could produce. I use a lot also um, what students have done or have participated in the years before. Helping the learners developing a social presence in the L2, engaging in the online communities in the L2, becoming a digital citizens in the L2. So really we are there to help, to scaffold, foster opportunities for social interactions, widening the language learning space. So indeed, I see the language teachers as prospectors of real world tasks. Yeah? Let's go and dig out. Let's see what are the places where I can send them outside the classroom virtually. Experience, experiencer, sorry for my French, of real world tasks. Okay, so you, when we, Think about developing articles, for instance, uh, on Wikipedia, which is a good example. Um, I've done it myself first. I do it myself first, always, to be a model, to go through the process, to see where are the difficulties, and also to, to pinpoint where are, where are the occasions to focus on specific you know, language competencies. As a participant, myself with them, uh, as a model, 
as you said, mentors and guides and also evaluators. And how do we evaluate uh, the kind of participation uh, participations the the learners do online is really by having them reflect it's it's more of the about uh than than what they do there uh, because the peers in those communities will be there as evaluators they 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 will you know encourage the the users to participate more or less or let them know if you know they're a misfit or they should do things differently and so on so that's the kind of evaluation they have in the real life and you are the evaluators of you know what they have learned of uh, of their critical evaluation of their own process uh, in participating in those sites practice before we move on to examples, any questions or comments so far? Yes, there are some questions. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think it, just in relation to this part of the presentation that just uh, ended, so someone was asking for the Wikipedia example. For, mm -hmm. How do you handle other members of the community, i.e. not students, modifying what the students might have written? Mm -hmm. I don't handle... I'm gonna go back. I don't. I don't handle. I actually. I make the students aware that this can happen, and it can happen to anybody. It has happened to me on Wikipedia, not on Wiki Travel, but students actually learn that when they they if you look at their their history is their their historic. So here you can see. You know, uh, for instance, Babel Amigo here, those are robots, you know, so uh, teach, uh, learners and I actually learn that this can happen, you know, that uh, that a website can be cleaned, uh, that um, that it's part of the game. So um, there are also uh, sandboxes uh, in Wikipedia, for instance, or Wiki Travel. So if students develop an article in the sandbox before, the, this information will not disappear. Or they can also rehearse this outside of the platform, right? Like if they write a blog, for instance, the blog is different, but people can post comments. But, you know, with Wiki, it's a little bit more dynamic and, and uh, collaborative. Uh, from from outside, the blog is more comments about what you have written, but people can rehearse the task uh, outside the platform or in uh, you know in a sandbox and a sandpit uh, prior. So I think that's a, a follow up question that's it's still related to what you're discussing. How do you ensure that student work is not treated in an abusive way when posted on outside platforms? And that I think is a is a concern that a lot of like, teachers overall in yeah. language teachers yeah. might have. Uh, I totally agree with that, and I, I, and as we know, there are there are communities or or, or sites or media uh, where people tend to be uh, more rude, rude than others. I think that yeah, awareness is a is is the first is the first word, but several of the tasks there that that I have used, you know, I teach young adults I teach at university level uh, it's very different than you know teaching in you know to younger children and sending younger you know younger um, teenagers for instance on websites so I think I would be careful and it would be my role um, as a language teacher to uh, make sure I'm aware of that and make sure that I, I know have my the right students participating in the right communities. Um, and sometimes we can be in, in social mode and not open participation, you know, or contributions to everyone. So there are ways to keep private some of the participations and some of the contributions. So I would be very careful in choosing where I send my students and what type of activities I have them to do. And I also ask my students, uh, for instance, you develop, when you use uh, Wiki Travel, when you become a contributor, you have a profile. 
Um, and if you develop a profile, you know, I ask them to use uh, acronyms and to remain anonymous and not to say I'm a, you know, I'm a student at the University of Ottawa, but just to say I have an interest in running and in, you know, in traveling and I live, you know, and when I live, I don't say specifics about where I live and so on. So I think we just have to develop those, uh, these awareness and select well. And I guess that goes along the development of digital citizenship, right? Being exactly. a citizen is understanding all these different elements. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and there's there's nothing like quitting also or you know, moving away from you know right. from a place if it's not a safe place. Yeah. But uh, you cannot so, predict everything. You know, you right. cannot predict everything, and sometimes it will happen. And if it's a disaster when a full article like this disappears, then you come back in the classroom, and that's why there's the, this jewel you know, grounding, and then you can talk about this and, and foresee how to solve together this problem. Yeah, so there's two more questions I think we can maybe, because they're kind of related to that conversation. Mm -hmm. So one has, uh, Natasha is asking, how do you keep task authentic while simplifying them for students? I... I don't simplify tasks. Yeah. If students are asked to participate in a community per se, for example, a forum of discussion, you know, when I I first, you, you start progressively, I'd say, you cannot really simplify a participation in a community that already exists there, but you can ask the students to participate uh, you in different postures, you know, not necessarily straight away as an expert, straight away as a one that belongs to the community, but maybe, you know, more carefully. Uh, some, some participation can only be by expressions of likes or by expressions of, you know, by reading and before, you know, I contribute. And if I contribute, you know, an output, uh, it can be a short sentence, you know, before I produce a full recipe and so on. So it's progressive in that sense. Mm. Yeah. So last and also kind of related to the conversation about Wikipedia and so on. Mm -hmm. Someone is asking, uh, what do you do with misinformation, right? So, or propaganda that might be uh, posted uh, uh, on these platforms. I think it's, in, again, I chose Wikitravel and not Wikipedia. You know, I chose Wikitravel because it's a travel guide um, and it's a, a friendlier environment. Uh, I think it's important that the students realize that uh, Wikipedia is not the Bible and that, yes, indeed, it, you know, it has uh, bias information uh, and that they have to remain aware uh, of that. And I think it always starts by analyzing the communities or analyzing the participatory sites where, you know, we're going to visit. Um, so first critical analysis, then participation with an awareness. I'm going to let you continue, Mme. Jose. There are a couple more questions, but they're more general, so we can come back to that later on. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. So let's now move on to practice. So what I have done here for you is I have actually uh, created a table with and listed my besties. Uh, I said my in French we say coup de cœur. Uh, those are are the digital tasks that I do with my students in these three courses I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. My French as a second language course, my second language teaching course, and my seminar. Uh, a, in um, bilingualism studies. Um, the tasks you will see here are not exclusively real world tasks, but they also are social and reflective tasks because it's important to develop a sense of self as well as cohesion and collaboration in the classroom and critical reflections with our students, as I'm sure you will agree with. So uh, here they are briefly uh, with the name I given to the task, the apps, app or apps that are involved. Sometimes students or often when, when possible students can choose 
um, if it's to a, you know, if they belong to a community, a community is out there, but if it's an app to, you know, to create something, then, then they, 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 uh, they can choose. Um, and I will, uh, and, and the classes that I have conducted and I have done those tasks with, I will show you example of three uh, of these tasks. Those are the ones in red. Uh, because they are documented also um, in the database of Elang citizen uh, citizen uh, digital tasks um, that I will show you just shortly after. So, and it goes progressively in the classroom, right? I start often with this task that I call my digital technology world. In fact, the digital technology world is the, the title that the Elang Citizen has given to my task, but the one I use is my digital universe with my students. And I ask them uh, using MindMop, which is a conceptual map creator, to actually describe their digital universe, the personal use, their professional use, their academic use, so that they develop a consciousness about the tools and the technologies that surround them. Then I move on to asking them to narrate, to tell me about how they have acquired languages, uh, starting from their ancestor, then, then their parents, then the language, and especially my students, they learn French. French is the second official language in Canada. So often they start early uh, in, in, um, in primary schools, in immersion program or core French programs. So I ask them to, um, to tell me how, you know, and where, so they localize this and we show you, I'll show you an example of that. And the software they use for that is StoryMap. Um, with the students, with the master's students, I use, uh, instead of doing, well, I do do the language bio, but also ask them to uh, describe a linguistic landscape of their choice. And often my students are international students and they choose to, uh, to bring us in their country uh, virtually and to describe a linguistic landscape uh, that belongs to them. So it's a similar task to the uh, geolocated language bio because it's the same app, but it's more of a linguistics uh, landscape story that they, that they tell me. Um, my second language teaching group, for instance, uh, I put them together and ask them to identify 10 essential apps for language learning and teaching. And they confront, you know, their Padlet, they compare their Padlets among peers to find out what, what, you know, what apps would be best. A good task I do with uh, my learners of French is the one I, I mentioned you before, it's called a forum on forum. So I send students participating on Le Routard, which is a travel forum and Reddit in French for Ottawa, for instance, and bring back in our own forum. So that's the foot in the classroom, their experience. So showcase uh, and narrate show and tell their experience in those and how they have interact as participants and as experts. Sometimes they can contribute. If people are asking about Canada, they come from such a place, they can answer in a posture of expert or ask themselves a question, for instance, about um, a travel they would like to make in some countries. A very good task I do with them, which is more audiovisual, is I am a YouTuber and I ask students to uh, to be um, to develop in, uh, instruction videos. So videos on how to you know uh, do your nails, videos on how to cook something, videos on how to decorate your room, and so on. How to study best. Uh, as YouTubers, YouTubers, and they also have done it using TikTok. Um, they create playlists with Spotify, posted on Notion. So I asked them to gather together a playlist 
for specific circumstances, uh, my playlist for running, uh, playlist uh, to listen around the campfire. We've had all sorts of playlists there with, you know, Frank showcasing Francophone singers and songs. Uh, they go on LinkedIn, uh, where they, I often the students at university, you know, level, they have a LinkedIn CV. So what I ask them is to bilingualize it. <laughs> so to add French components, to present themselves, to translate uh, jobs titles and so on, so that uh, their, uh, their CV is bilingual in the end. Um, collaborative and a group um, task that my students do is called an audio guide for an alternative destination in Ottawa. And for that, I use um, a software called Easy Travel, um, and it enables them to uh, to develop their own audio guide, multimodal guide online, all geolocalized of uh, of a specific uh, on all on a specific theme. I'll show you an example. And finally, they create a portfolio of them as francophile citizens of the web or call for the, those becoming teachers where they gather all the resources, all the, um, they showcase everything they have done during the course and they have a big reflection about what it is for them to be a Francophile citizen, you know, of the web. So I have really nice portfolios developed with Google, you know, from Google sites to Canva, Weebly, Wix, Book Creator, WordPress, so students will use all sorts for, uh, for creating those portfolios. So this is the digital universe of Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca uh, was part of my second language teaching course, and she really has organized, as you can see, her conceptual map in two main branches, personal use and professional use, and further divided it in social media, social media for family, for friends, personal hobbies, and then on a professional side, she has her as a student at the university, what are the apps and you know that, that are part of her universe, digital universe, and also as as um as she works for Service Canada, what are the, the pieces of software, for instance, like PeopleSoft that she uses there. And what I do, this is the first exercise I do with my students. After that, I ask them, you know, with these which ones, you know, do you already participate in French, you know, any of those where you have occasions of participating in French? So what are the communities that have, you know, various languages or that enable you to participate in the language you're learning in my class? So then they will say, you know, maybe Facebook, because I have some French uh, you know, friends, or maybe uh, at work, when I work with Service Canada, it's bilingual, I have occasions to use French a bit more, and I don't, but I could, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's the common reflection that everyone has for themselves, but they also compare their universe in the discussion forum, and then contrast. And <clears throat> together, I do ask them to identify some common uh, digital uses and some specific ones. Sometimes they're hobby related or work related. This is Giselle's life and language bio. Giselle uh, was an inter uh, MA, master's uh, students, international students from the, the United States uh, in my bill, in my um, um, bilingualism courses and through, through the story she's uh, She's showing us is that she's really a true multilingual uh, globe trotter, and um, she was conceived in Japan, as she says, and the parents lived in Tokyo to teach English. Moved on, born in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Then the family was visiting friends in the summer because her mom was is French. So what you can see and so on and so forth. Um, here, what you can see is that using story map, 
enabled her to organize and to structure her narrative and to include some multimodal elements such as photos and titles, et cetera. Some, uh, some students uh, also uh, will add external links, audios, videos uh, to their language bio. So this is a very good um, task for students to, to think about how they have acquired and the, their, 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 their languages and the journey with learning the languages and how that has also influences their life and the decisions they have taken in their lives. This one is the collaborative project I told you about. So this is the audio guide of Eileen and Sabrina uh, built with Easy Travel. And it's it's all in French. Uh, so it's called Scene Caffeine, Find Your Dolls in the Region of Ottawa. And they um, their audio guide is really a complex multimodal composition uh, that the platform Easy Travel help them to construct uh, with uh, dedicated spaces for the creation of audio, of video, text element, as well as geolocated markers, as you will see now. So you could even go there and if you if you click on the QR code, you will have it on your phone. So here is the, um, the first place. It's, you can see a geolocated area in Ottawa and you can see the whole travel that they they have done. I asked them to do it physically and then to pin it on the on the map. So what they have decided to do, you know, was the audio, uh, and also the video, the text, and the photos. I'll let you hear a little. Le Café Figaro is certainly l'un de mes préférés, surtout pour un rendez-vous assez. That's Eileen. That's a cafe near the university. <laughs> and then she starts talking. And then you move on, on the map, as well as in... Um, in the description from a cafe to another. And it concludes with a conclusion and they have actually signed this and it's open. So this is out there and this is a, a website that people can consult and that they can react to. A really, a really good project for the students. A big part of the Lang Citizen project was dedicated to uh, the design of a task template that you can see in front of you there, um, and task models, uh, examples for teachers and the learner, uh, selecting websites of various types of tasks and various configuration of social interactions, work on, you know, where they can work on uh, dimensions of dimensions of. Uh, digital citizenship, digital literacy, language and intercultural competences uh, with suggestions of possible steps for the teachers and each digital task as a teacher and a learner template. And this learner template, uh, the learner template, sorry, has hints, work on the language related aspects and the for you to think about like the more reflective sections. Um, so we can look at this database now and you just, Click on this, we are here already. So um, some details about, you know, what real world tasks are and, and, and then what reflective tasks are about. And you can search the database with, you know, this in mind. I want a task which deals with digital literacy. So these are the literacies involved to raise awareness on how to act as a good citizen, you know, ethical sure reviews for learners of level A, you know, 2, B1, B2, level of education, and the type of language activities involved and containing a dimension in particular, or 
<laughs> what you can do is look at the 33 tasks that we have there online already. So this is the one I have created, my geolocated language bio, the one I showed you. And it, you would go and this is, you know, like a summary of what you will find there uh, of the task. And you can download the task sheet right here. So it's the same. It's the same with all of them. My digital technology world, for instance, the other one I showed you, again, you have, you know, summary, then you can download the test sheet, teacher sheet there, example, website, and then possible steps for teachers, and then my digital universe for students, and this is the, the, the sheet that you can give them. Website, digital citizenship and literacy that they will develop, plurilingual intercultural aspect, hints to work on the language related aspects in that task and so on and so forth. So I can see that the time is flying. <laughs> um, the last, question I had for you very briefly uh, was this one. Would you use some of these digital tasks in your context? I know you didn't have much time to look at everything, but at a glance, would that, is that something appealing to you? And uh, would you use them? So all, all these resources are at your disposal. I can see that you would. <laughs> Thank you. And you can create your own. You can decide whether these are social or these are more um, real world tasks or they are tasked more to reflect about usage, critically reflect about usage of technologies and participation on website. What would be your real world task? Well, we won't have time for that today, but you may want to think about that and share it with me. Uh, and to conclude, well, I invite you to think about finding, using, adapting, creating an array of possible digital tasks out there. I know you already do it, some of you a lot. Uh, tasks that are rooted uh, in established social practices, uh, fostering for your language learners, digital self and identity construction, discursive and practice communities, professional identity and empowerment, basically citizenship digital citizenship. So thank you. Merci, gracias, danke, obrigada, chéché, shukran, efkaristo, tak, djinkuye, et voila. So this is how to, uh, thank you for listening, for your questions and comments, and here is how to contact me. So thank you so much, Marie-José. I think you can see people in the chat thanking you for sharing all these wonderful ideas and resources. We have a couple, a few questions left, so maybe sure. we can take a few minutes for those. Um, so I think in relation to uh, the task with the cafe, for example, yes. uh, somebody was saying, did students ask for prior permission before filming? So do you have a process where, uh, you know, what kind of permission would they need to get for this? The, the students are young adults, right? So they decided that they would explore some cafes and they, you know, they went to the cafes and they asked the owners. So they have videos because they had the permission to do it. I never, I do not conduct them in the task. I don't tell them you have to video, you have to. The only instruction that they had is that they had to produce an audio comment. And with the audio comments, they added some written information as well as created the virtual map. And some of them went beyond, took photos and also added the videos. So it yeah. was entirely up to the students. And I guess somebody else was asking, have you ever faced students and willingness to participate in such mm -hmm. activities? Mm -hmm. Willingness to participate. I think I'm very good at convincing students that I'm going, they're going to do something that's meaningful uh, that, you know, and also ask my students the type of communities they are involved in and what they like to do. So I think it's important to, to look at, you know, to talk 
at the beginning of a course, you know, or at the beginning of before introducing new communities to talk about them and what they like. I think the the YouTube, um, the 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 video of instructions they have to produce, uh, they really enjoy that because they showcase things they know. Um, so the willingness to communicate comes along, you know, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there were a lot of questions about this, you know, how do you, do you, people who don't want to go on Facebook or might not want, I mean, yes. I think it's well, the they, whole there's public. alternatives, yeah. there's alternatives. I have had students, for instance, who didn't want to share, so you can keep, keep private videos, but some of them even, you know, I've said, oh, you know, I'm, they do work aside. They, they give me a video just to me. So, so there's a minority of students, but you know, it's okay. Uh, that not everyone will want to participate to everything. That's that's fine. All right, we're going to take two more questions, and then after that, we'll have to uh, to end the the webinar. Somebody was at, is asking. Uh, that's Constanza who's asking. Do you have examples of tasks that engage with citizenship in the sense of social justice responsibility? We have good tasks. A, a couple of those uh, in the in the database that you will see. A poster against uh, cyber bu bullying, for instance, and other websites where you can uh, create um, what do you, uh, how do you call it? Like um, surveys, you know, uh, and 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 post them publicly and so on. Yes. So I think it's a little tangential, but it's uh, so this person, Liz Lisa, is asking. I'm teaching an advanced ESL writing course in a, at a university. And with AI, I'm wondering whether essays will become a less used evaluation source. So what is your opinion on doing a few multimedia tasks, like I think the ones you presented that involve writing yes. but also, uh, and fewer formal essays? Yeah, AI will, AI will, you know, take more and more a place in our language courses and, and in producing content such as the one you have seen for the audio guide, for instance, that's for sure that students could actually ask the AI to produce the text. Um, I think it first is the lesson about honesty uh, and about copyright. And I think that the more <laughs> The more we go about, the more we all involve multimodality because that's uh, this involves the students talking, student, you know, pre creating videos and so on. So the more compositional, you know, in terms of mode, is the artifact that is the outcome of the task. The more complex, the more students have to kind of also uh, resort to their own, uh, you know internal knowledge and competences. So it's a, it's a mix of both. Yeah, so somebody in relation to this says, well, you can flip the task. So if AI creates, it, maybe the students can criticize, right, or correct. Yes, of course, yes, yes. And I'm sure that this was covered very well in the session that you did prior this summer on AI, on the use of yeah. AI, yeah. So I think last question, uh, it's more general. At the beginning of the presentation, you talked about the courses that you teach at the university and how you are introducing, whether they're students uh, of, of French or they are future teachers of, uh, of, a, of French and possibly ESL. So this person is asking, are there online professional development courses that could expand on the kinds of um, concepts that you defined earlier. You are welcome to contact me, but also uh, Elang and Elang Citizen. You will see online that we have uh, we have done some workshops with uh, with teachers. I do workshops with teachers, you know, and my colleagues also do workshops with teachers. Um, but those uh, two of them have already been recorded. Uh, and there are resources out there. If you, your institutions or university is interested in, you know, in, in me going deeper or in more details about either the practice or the approach or the theoretical uh, foundations, you, you know, you, you are welcome to contact me.